so lovely to be here with you today. Thank you. I mean, I feel very humbled after, goodness, um, listening to some of the most inspirational people talk. So, uh, yeah, I feel very humbled to be here and excited to be here as well. So given the name of the event and the topic of today's conversation, I thought it prescient to start with the moment that you found your voice. Mm -hmm. So you were born Victoria Adams. Yep. You were raised in Hertfordshire, about an hour outside of London. Yep. In a comfortable family home with a family who really supported your ambitions and your love of performing arts in the mm -hmm. stage. Now, for the purposes of research for this interview, I went back kind of in the YouTube hole and I looked at some old videos of you at stage school performing. Mm -hmm. And I did not see a timid adolescent unsure about what they were up to. I saw a young woman with focus and intention. And I was wondering whether you could share with us whether how much of your personal transformation from pop star to entrepreneur and everything in between has been a strategic one and whether that young girl knew what was ahead and did she have a master plan? I've always had to work really, really hard. Nothing ever came easy to me. You know, when I was at school, I was never the most academic. I was never the pretty girl in the class. I was never the popular girl in the class. I mean, quite the opposite. I was very badly bullied at school and I always really, really struggled. And it was always just about keeping my head down, working hard. I was very close to my family, you know, very much come from a working, um, working class family. And I wanted to go on the stage and I wanted to sing and dance. But again, I wasn't the best. It was always just about working really, really hard. And I've had a lot of knockbacks. And every time I was knocked down, I got back up again. And that was, you know, that's just the way that I've always been, you know, very ambitious, um, very determined, never afraid to put in the hard work and very focused. And I believe in creative visualization. I believe in putting it out into the universe. And if you work hard enough, um, and believe in yourself enough, then what you can achieve, um, the sky's the limit. So you came to the public consciousness in a little known girl group mm. called the Spice Girls, yeah. which of course went on to be a complete uh, mega brand. Mm. There were five of you. Yeah. Each of you had your own personas. Yeah. Yours was Posh Spice. Glamorous, sophisticated, a predilection for the odd piece of designer clothing. <laughs> What did you learn about yourself during your time in the Spice Girls? Do you know, I think because I was so bullied when I was at school, I was very, very shy, a little bit introvert. And when I met the Spice Girls, I met four other girls like me. We were all underdogs in our own way, individually, not that great, but collectively, we really worked and we had something very special. And most people out there could relate to one of us. Mm. And we'd all come from a similar place, meaning that we'd all had to work really, really hard. And together we then began a mission of girl power. And this was a long time ago. I mean, I remember the first time um, we went to a record company and we said, we want to be on the cover of, of a magazine. We were told, well, girls don't sell magazines. You know, you're never going to find yourself on the cover of a, of a magazine as a girl group. You know, People only want to see boys on, on magazines. And we began this mission of girl power. We're saying, you know, we're not just as good as boys, right, ladies? We're better. <laughs> and, and we broke barriers and we went on a mission to empower not just girls, but yes, boys as well. And it's OK if you're the underdog. It's OK if you're not the popular one. It's OK if you're different. It's about embracing who you are and being proud of that. I mean, around that theme of girl power and female empowerment, what do you think of how, how you think of female empowerment now versus mm -hmm. then? How has that evolved and transformed? I think it's really, I think it's obviously, it's really, really evolved. Um, and me personally, it's now about empowering women through fashion, and beauty, it was music, you know. Girl power will always be a part of my message, whether that's music, fashion, beauty. You know, I want to do what I do because I want to make women, you know, and men that buy into my brand feel like the best 
most powerful version of themselves. That's why I'm doing what I do. And in the Spice Girls, I suppose it was your first introduction to the power of that personal brand identity mm. and how to kind of leverage that. Talk, could you talk to us a bit about when you first kind of had this realisation that there was something in this and you could... Yeah, I mean, I learned so much about branding being in the Spice Girls. You know, I went from being a regular teenager to all of a sudden being on the cover of every magazine, every tabloid newspaper, constantly being talked about, herds of paparazzi and fans outside my family home. And it happened almost overnight. Um, and before I knew it, you know, we were, gosh, we were advertising everything from Pepsi to Chubba Chubbs lollies to Walker's crisps to you name it. We were advertising everything all around the world. And, you know, we weren't just big in the UK. We were massive in America and Asia. And we were traveling around the world having the best time. I mean, traveling the world with four of my best friends. It was, it was fantastic. And I learned so much about branding and marketing. What were some of the kind of key learnings from that time in terms of branding and how to kind of leverage that, that power, I suppose? You know, I think that, you know, we had the ability to sell and it wasn't always about the check. It was looking about the marketing power of the different brands that we were, you know, partnering with, if you like. Yeah. And so then kind of fast forwarding slightly to 1999, mm -hmm. you married David Beckham. Yeah. In a very high profile ceremony with those iconic golden thrones. Oh, can you believe um, it? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> when wow. you look back at that, kind of, yep. what, what do you think? I mean, about that version of you then versus the version of you now? You know, I mean, I think that the media glamorised the wedding much more than it actually was. I mean, yes, it was in a magazine. Yes, we sat on thrones. You know, me and David, <laughs> I love to have fun. I think I work very, very hard. I take what I do very seriously. I want to be a great wife, a really great mum, but I want to have fun as well. And sometimes my tongue-in-cheek sense of humour does tend to get me in trouble. <laughs> um, so, but, but the wedding was really, it wasn't as huge as everybody made out. You know, we had the football team, there we had the Spice Girls there and it was family and friends and it was actually much more intimate than it looked um, but I don't think I realized when I met David quite what the two of us together um, would 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 be if you like you know the Spice Girls were huge when I first met David he wasn't actually even playing for the first team um, at Manchester United um, he'd only just started to, to break through, if you like. But then when you took David and Manchester United and then you took me and the Spice Girls, it was huge. I mean, everywhere that we went, we were, we were followed by fans and paparazzi and constantly being talked about. And, you know, that's not always going to be nice things that you're having to read about, you know. But um, it, was, it, was, it was huge. And a lot of people at the time alluded to, were we only together? to build a brand and I'm like listen we've been married for 25 years now if I didn't genuinely love this man I mean you know 25 years is a long long time um, but you know I suppose a whole brand was born at that mm. time did you I have that strategic it. conversation was there a moment where you sat down you know to become one if you like to quote the famous oh I like one. that <laughs> But did uh, you have that moment where you... I mean, we are much lighter, aren't we? I mean, we said that we were going to be sort of like a little bit lighter than the other, the other um, incredible people that have sat up here, but... Um, did you have that chat where you, like, look, yeah. together we can... No. No. I mean, right from the beginning, I mean, really, I... It was never about that. You know, quite soon after we met when I then wasn't in the Spice Girls anymore, we had our first opportunity, which actually was with Coty. We had one of the first ever celebrity fragrances. And this was quite a long time before celebrities were creating fragrances. And I'd been working as a designer for um, brands in Asia and also America. But the success of our fragrance <coughs> together, which was very, very lucrative, enabled me to then build the brand that I now mm. own now and bring everything in-house and... Because that, that was leading on to my next question. It's, it's really interesting because when the Spice Girls went on hi hiatus, kind of early noughties we're in now, mm. um, 
you had already walked runways, you'd guest edited magazines, you'd had very lucrative deals with Reebok and Rock and Republic, for example, mm -hmm. you'd started to forge your path. What was it that made you think you could cut it in the notoriously mm. difficult world to penetrate that is fashion yeah. as a credible designer? Do you know, I've, I mean, I've always loved fashion. It's always been my passion, really, more than music. I loved what I did with the Spice Girls, and I'm so proud of everything I achieved, but fashion was always what I really, really wanted to do. Um, and I went into the fashion industry very naive. Would I have the guts to do it now, knowing the industry now? Probably not, but I didn't. And it was all about really just creating what I couldn't find as a consumer and doing it in a very humble way. I started by showing 10 dresses, um, presentation style in New York, because I happened to be living in Los Angeles at the time, narrating through these 10 dresses. Um, and it was all, it happened very, very organically, if you like. And I did it in a very humble way. I didn't start with big shows and coming out with dry ice around me when I took my bow. It was, it was all, it was very, very honest and it was about the product. And I remember Mark Jacobs saying to me, um, he just said, you know, when I had, I had gone on the record saying how I was impressed that the journalists that had come to see my collections had left their preconceptions at the door. And he said to me, you've got to stop saying that. They did not leave their preconceptions at the door. The product spoke for itself. The product was great. And that is why, you know, you got the good reviews right from the beginning. And, you know, why the product was selling out before it even hit the shop floor, um, you know, with our wholesale partners. So it was always about the product and being honest, not trying to do too much. Mm. And I was very hands-on with every single aspect of the business, you know, even with the design details. I knew if I wanted to add an extra seaming detail or a pocket, I knew how much more that would make the garment cost by the time the customer went to buy it. Mm. And I was very aware of every single part of the business. And I love what I do so much every aspect of the business, you know. Um. And, and they, talking about those, those preconceived ideas that people may have had, and I know you have gone on the record before to talk about how perhaps some people weren't so welcoming. Yeah. Um, could you talk to us a little bit about the layer of thick skin you must have mm. grown over mm. the years and how you deal with those knockbacks and some of the more emotional challenges? Yeah, I mean, I think that... I feel that the fashion industry has really welcomed me. I don't feel like I've had any knockbacks, to be honest with you. I've had to prove myself, but then I've always had to prove myself. You know, when I was at school, I had to prove myself. When I was at dancing school, I had to prove myself. Even now, I feel like I'm constantly having to prove myself when everyone says I can't sing. Not that I don't care anymore, but, you know, <laughs> it's always been about that. But with fashion, I think it's... N I didn't feel that I had any knockbacks at all. I felt that it was just about the product speaking for itself. And it did. And every season, I want to better myself for me, really, and mm. for my community and for my, for my customer. Um, as, as an entrepreneur, have you had setbacks and challenges that you found, that you found difficult? Oh, gosh, absolutely, go? absolutely. I mean, I started this brand a long, long time ago, and I think fashion is a difficult industry, very, very difficult, and it doesn't come without its challenges. Um, and that's hard, but I think that we're getting to a place now with fashion, um, which is very, very exciting. We're looking um, at being, you know, profitable in the very near future, which is for an independent brand to come out of COVID and be, be, go through everything that we've been through over the years. That's huge and something that I'm very, very excited about. You know, my beauty business that I started a few years ago was, um, was profitable very soon after, after launch. So I feel like I have two daughters. I have beauty and I have fashion. Mm. Both very, very different businesses. Um, both successful in their own, in, in their own right. Mm. Um, but there's always going to... I mean, I think that when I had my first show in Paris, before I even put one item of clothing on the catwalk, for me it was a success to be an independent brand and to still have a business post-COVID, let alone having a show in Paris. I mean, that was a big, big deal. For me, I was, it was a success before anything had gone out there. Mm. And I think that's why I got so emotional after the show. I was thinking, well, I'm going to go on the stage and I want my picture to 
you know, I want to look good in this picture at the end of the show. And I just walked out on the catwalk to take my bow and I, I burst out crying. I was very emotional. And it was because I just felt so proud of me and my team. You know, it hasn't come easily. We mm. continue to have to work really, really, really hard. How much do you think that being of a celebrity status mm. um, is an asset in this journey in terms of making a success for a fashion business? It surely it's got to be a boon. Well, I think it's a double-edged sword because, you know, sometimes it can work in your favour and then sometimes, um, you know, I, I have a spotlight on my business like a lot of other brands do not. And, you know, sometimes that's great and, and, and sometimes it's not. But it's something that I've never complained about. I accept that. Um, another thing that I just thought that I, I learned a lot about the Spice Girls, sorry, just going back, was PR. Mm. as well as marketing. I learned a lot about press when I was in the Spice Girls. And, and what kind of things specifically? Oh, gosh. Press? I mean, I think the things that have been said um, about me and David in the past, there was no way that people would be allowed to print those things now, mm. nowadays. Absolutely not. And I learned an enormous amount at that time. I mean, you do, as a family, you live under constant mm. media scrutiny or in the headlines at the moment. Mm. Is there anything you'd like to share about that experience? And, and how does that feel to be constantly written about and watched all of the time? I mean, I think in comparison to what people used to say a long time ago when, you know, there were no, there were no limits to what anybody could say, really, and it was horrific at times it really really was and frightening when you have children um i think the press that we get now in comparison to then um is 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 pretty easy to you know to swallow if you like i think look it's always going to be upsetting when 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 people write things that are not necessarily true um but i think we've just come to um to accept that and i think the great thing about social media now is that you have more of a voice yourself i think that in the past you know the media painted a picture of me and who i was you know i was the miserable one that never smiled um <laughs> And to be fair, I did look that way most of the time in pictures. But I think the great thing now about social media is you have the opportunity to really communicate with your community and show people who you really are. Mm. So I feel that to a certain extent we have taken the power back, mm. which, I think is, which I think is great. So amongst all of that noise and um, scrutiny, mm. how do you as an individual stay focused and find your centre. I mean, we're talking about transformation mm. and the growth that comes with that as human beings. Yeah. What do you do as, you know, to, to, find, to find your centre and retain your focus? Do you know, I love what I do. I feel very lucky. I feel very, very blessed to have an amazing family. Um, I'm very, very positive. You know, I believe in constructive criticism, but generally speaking, you know, it's, it's about being focused, being positive, um, and staying focused, really, you know, and a lot of time in the gym in the morning to kind of get my head around the day ahead, you know, it's about being, I, I like to be kind to myself and, you know, um, look after myself and look after my children. And I just love, I'm very passionate about what I do. I love going to work every day. I have an amazing team of people around me. Mm. And I feel lucky to have this creative outlet that I love so much. And I have so much that I want to say. You know, I built this brand. I've been building it since 2008. And there is so much more that I want to do. You know, we've done fashion. You know, we also have sunglasses. We've recently launched um, accessories that have become very, very successfully very quickly, which is, um, which is exciting because for us, that should and hopefully will be the gateway into Asia. Mm. Um, I've had great collaborations along the way and learned so much, which I'm hoping that I can build on as well. And now beauty, which is incredible. I'm enjoying that so much. Great. And so it, to close then, I suppose I'm interested in you as an individual and you've had this incredible journey of many incarnations is there a future that doesn't involve fashion victoria that is a, a whole new version of you that we're going to see in five years time in a different industry or a new world or have you found your groove now and, and i mean look i would 
I'm always open to ideas um, and there's so much that I want to do in this industry. There's so much. Um, no, I mean, I can't think of anything else. I'm not going to, I don't, I don't know. You don't want to rule it out. I don't want to rule it out. <laughs> so let's, let's see. But um, there's still so much to do. And I think Paris was such a big moment for me and a real flag in the sand moment and the attention in a very positive way that, that, that my brand received after Paris Fashion Week um, was, was, was enormous. And now I think the business is, is on track and it's getting very exciting. Um, Great, watch this space. So I'm gonna focus on fashion just at the moment. Yeah. But who knows? Well, thank you, Imran, for holding this space for us here over the last few so days. Much. It's been amazing. And to you, the audience, and to Victoria Beckham. Thank you so much. Thank you.